Let us pray. Gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. A pastor friend of mine tells the story of one communion Sunday in his big flagship UCC church in a very tony suburb of Boston. As befitting their well-heeled congregation, the communion table is formal, set with white linen and silver candlesticks and crystal chalices. That Sunday, as Martin was beginning the communion liturgy, inviting people to share in Jesus' body and blood, the reverent silence was broken by a little girl who exclaimed loudly, Ew! Yuck! <laughs> Her parents were mortified. The congregation was stricken, as if the little girl had just splattered blood all over the pristine tablecloth, which in a sense, she had. But Martin wasn't horrified. In fact, he was impressed. I think that little girl was the only one who was listening, he said. Let's face it, this language that we heard today, this graphic imagery that comes closer to cannibalism than Christianity, it's gross. It's hard to hear, and it's harder to understand. I think most of us tolerate it by focusing on its metaphorical meaning. We're very comfortable with that, especially around here. Jesus is simply making the point that he is our spiritual food, right? Very poetic, certainly not to be taken literally. But I wonder. It seems to me here that Jesus really means what he is saying. He doubles down, and he basically says, I'm not kidding you. You have to eat my flesh and drink my blood to have eternal life. Now, I understand that Jesus likes to keep it real, but ooh, yuck, this is making it a little too real. So what do we do with this text? Besides toss out the scriptures? Besides slowly back away from the communion table? And maybe even from Jesus? The issue is bigger than this one difficult text, however. There are passages in our sacred scriptures, many of them, that can be really hard for us to swallow. There are texts in there that we can't possibly square with our 21st century reality. Creation in six days, an ark that holds every species on earth, a shepherd boy slaying a giant, a baby being born to a virgin. And those are the benign ones. What happens when we come across passages where God appears to condone rape and slavery and genocide? How do we deal with all those folks who are left behind from the ark to drown? Or Jesus' statement that we have to hate our families if we want to follow him? How do we deal with a book and a faith that asks us to do that? Holding our scriptures in tension with our reality, with our morality, with our critical thinking is essential to being a faithful modern Christian but it may well be the most difficult part. Learning how to see these ancient writings for what they are and for what they aren't is how we discover their meaning. And it takes work. And this is not just a cerebral exercise. Our faith depends upon it. We can't be Christians and ignore these difficult passages in the Bible. We need to engage them. But neither can we rely on a superficial or literal reading. We have to go deeper. We need to put on different lenses. You see, every time we read an ancient text, we are actually seeing it through three lenses at the same time. The lens of the folks who first heard Jesus' words, his followers. The lens of those for whom this story was first told, in this case, John's community, and us, hearing these words in the 21st century. Now, most of the time, we focus only on our own hearing, measuring the words solely against our own experience. And unfortunately, this causes a lot of bad theology and a misinformed and potentially dangerous faith. Sometimes we do get past ourselves, and we go so far as to place Jesus' words in his first-century context, 
And this is an important step and can go a long way to deepening our understanding. But what we usually forget is that in every scripture text, there is someone between Jesus and us, a middleman, someone who is translating Jesus' words through the lens of his own, and it was a he, time and place, and then passing them on to us. We need to remember that these middlemen, the four writers of the gospel, were not following Jesus around with steno pads. They were writing decades after Jesus, in a post-war context that Jesus didn't even know. They were writing for people who were asking often different theological questions and had different concerns than Jesus' immediate friends and disciples had. And this middleman lens is key, especially, I think, in John's Gospel. As I mentioned last week, John's Gospel is the latest one, coming almost a century after Jesus, and the Jewish world had become a very different place. You see, the folks in John's church were struggling to keep their faith alive, their new faith alive, in a hostile world, after Rome had destroyed the temple and the Jews had fled Jerusalem. As they moved farther and farther away from their Jewish roots in both time and place, they were encountering new theologies that were moving the person of Jesus farther and farther from their lives. These new teachings often called the Gnostic teachings, were promoting a rather disembodied Jesus, making him more spirit than flesh. These teachings said that, among other things, our our bodies are flawed and unholy and holding us back, and that we need to ignore them and transcend them if we want to become one with God. In Gnostic theological terms, Jesus' humanity, his flesh and blood humanity, had become more of a stumbling block than a door. He was less Jesus and more Christ and became an object of abstract spiritual quest rather than a personal, visceral relationship. And so John feared that as Jesus became less and less human, he would become less and less real. So in the provocative words of John's gospel this morning, Jesus keeps it very real. He brings it all right back home to the body. He doesn't let us remain in the lofty and safe world of metaphors. Last Sunday, we wrestled with what it means for Jesus to call himself the bread of life and food from heaven. This week, he pushes past that polite, poetic, refined language, and he gets in our face. He is graphic. He is practically gory. The Greek verb that John uses for eating is actually closer to chewing or crunching with your teeth, seriously. No less than seven times in that short passage, he tells us we actually need to eat his flesh and drink his blood to gain eternal life. Seven times. It's excessive, really. (laughs) It's as if Jesus is trying to gross us out to make a point, which I believe is true. But it's very hard to see his point unless we put on our Jesus lenses. For there is a whole backstory to these words that we can't possibly see on our own. The first is, is that these words of eating flesh and drinking blood were considered blasphemous. Eating human flesh was taboo. It's what demons did. It's what idolaters did. In the primitive spiritual world, human sacrifice is made only to God. For humans to eat it violated every boundary around the relationship we have with God. It actually puts us in the place of God which is unthinkable. So why would Jesus go there? Perhaps as offensive as it is, Jesus uses this violent language precisely to shake us up and wake us up, perhaps even to weed out those followers who were just looking for comforting spiritual cliches and a bland theology. Those who have been lulled into a passive reverence, a bit like those folks around the fancy communion table. Perhaps Jesus' outrageous words are chosen to shock us into hearing just how radical his invitation is. It's as if he is crossing a line in order to see if we're still with him, asking, how far are you willing to go and still follow me? And as John tells the story, much of the crowd backs away after this. It was more than they could take. Only his true friends are left. 
those ones who are willing to go the distance. The second important thing to know is that when he speaks of flesh and blood, Jesus is using a Hebrew idiom, which refers to the whole person, not just the biological parts, but the heart and the mind and the spirit and the feelings and the hopes and the dreams and the fears and the joys, everything. So when he says we need to eat his flesh and blood, he is pressing the point that his love for us, God's love for us, is never theoretical. And it is never partial. In Jesus, the whole person of God meets us to love and redeem and sustain our whole person. The good, the bad, and the ugly. He makes the point that our bodies are not a barrier to God, for it is through a human body that we see the extent of God's love. Jesus doesn't back down when it's clear that his passion for justice and his compassion for us will break his body and spill his blood. He's willing to give us his whole person. He doesn't keep you or me at arm's length. He gets in our faces. He makes it real. He uses gory, graphic language, gut-wrenching language to show us that when it comes to loving us, he has skin in the game, literally. And yes, that makes us uncomfortable. We don't want blood spattered all over our nice white tablecloth. We like the idea of God becoming one of us, but we don't want to be reminded about what that might actually look like, smell like taste like. We don't want to think that if God has a body, it can actually be broken. Like those beautiful communion elements in Martin's church, we prefer to use lovely, refined, theological words like incarnation to explain this relationship. But here's the thing. The root of incarnation is carnal, as in bodies, as in sex as in blood, as in flesh, as in death, as in the most messy, wonderful, and terrifying parts of being human. And Jesus tells us that unless we are willing to embrace everything about our humanity, even the stuff we'd rather not deal with, we can't possibly live a full life, an abundant life, an eternal life. We can't get to God unless we are willing to embrace And in words often too tough to hear in jest, Jesus' humanity. And this is the biggest scandal of our faith. It's what scares away most of the crowds. It's what drew the line between John's folks and the synagogue. It's what caused the early church to be misunderstood as cannibals and idolaters. It's why our faith is not for the faint of heart. It removes all the abstraction all the doctrines, all the intellectual stuff, all the complicated spiritual theology. Jesus doesn't ask us for any of this. He requires no tests before we come to the table. He says, I'm here. I'm real. You're hungry. Take a bite. Friends, I don't know what to do with this language any more than you do. But I know I can't ignore it. Our faith is not passive. It's not abstract or polite. It is real. Heck, maybe it's even too real. But that's why it matters. And that's why we're here. And underneath all of it, it is good news to share. Thanks be to God. Amen.